Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Healthy Aging Lecture. We are at 11 o'clock. I'm gonna give it just one or two more minutes. We still have folks that are joining us. So I just wanna give everyone a chance to get settled. So hold tight and we'll get going in just a couple minutes. All right, let's get rolling today. Um, again, welcome everyone to the Healthy Aging Lecture. My name is Kate Tutape. I am the manager in the Senior Health Department here at VHC Health. And before I get into introducing our speaker and the topic, I just want to remind folks in case uh, you haven't joined us before or it's been a while, um, our sessions are recorded. So everybody who registered for this webinar will get a link to the recording. So you're welcome to share that link or listen to it yourself again. Um, and in addition, we welcome your, your comments and questions. So please feel free to use the chat box that's part of that control panel um, on the webinar and feel free to send questions as they, as they come to mind. And we will monitor that and um, get to those questions towards the end of the presentation, okay? So today we are um, having a, a presentation on the topic of digestive health, particularly issues that um, we may be facing as we get older, going through the aging process. So I'm really excited and happy to welcome one of our physicians, um, Dr. Ami Patel. She is a gastroenterologist with VHC Health Physicians. Um, she's actually located over in our new outpatient pavilion. Um, so right here on campus. And Dr. Patel earned her um, medical, degree, medical degree from DeBuff College of Osteopathic Medicine. She went on to complete her internal medicine residency at Advocate Lutheran General Hospital in Illinois, and then went on to complete her fellowship in gastroenterology in New York. Um, and I might add that during her years in medical school, she also completed her MBA. So Dr. Patel, I'm guessing you didn't get much sleep during those years. So anyways, you were busy. Um, and uh, she has a special interest, special focus in a variety of different areas, including stomach diseases, internal diseases, excuse me, intestinal diseases, and colon cancer screening. So I'm guessing we're gonna hear about some of those areas today. I will say um, the computer that Dr. Patel is on at the hospital does not have a camera, so you will hear from her, but you will not see her on camera. Again, I want to welcome you, Dr. Patel, and I will let you uh, take it away. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to make sure that everyone, you know, you can hear me okay. Um, and so, 
I am very excited to be working with Virginia Hospital Center. Um, I'm back where I grew up, and so it's a very familiar and great place to be. Um, thank you for having me on for this lecture. Healthy aging and the gastrointestinal tract, some things are you know, common as we age, some things kind of set off alarm bells. Um, so we'll touch on some of those today. Now, let's see. You know, what is included in the GI tract? I think that's where we should, you know, first start. And so here we have the esophagus, there's the stomach, stomach goes into the small intestine. Um, you may not know that the small intestine is about 20 feet long. It's doing so much absorption for our body um, and very important. And all of that's kind of compacted into your abdomen there. The small intestine is divided into three different parts. Uh, the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. Then we have the colon, which everybody's pretty familiar with. We also have the liver and the gallbladder, as well as the pancreas kind of hiding behind there. So those are all different parts um, that, you know, we look at as GI physicians. And so kind of starting at the top, um, we, you know, what type of esophageal diseases are out there? I have patients coming in as young as 30 years old, you know, and up to in the 90s talking about just heartburn, reflux, and GERD. So uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease is what GERD stands for, and reflux becomes more common as you age. Um, what are, you know, it continues to be just a very common disease. Um, it's diagnosed sometimes by primary cares, GI doctors, surgeons as well. We have our, you know, societies like the American College of Gastroenterology kind of telling us how we should approach these types of diseases. Um, we, you know, classic GERD symptoms, we tend to put patients, um, especially, you know, if you're seen by a primary care doctor, on a medication called a proton pump inhibitor, probably heard of Prilosec over the counter, Omeprazole or Protonix to see if it does help the symptoms. Um, when symptoms come back after the medication is tried for eight weeks, that's when you know an endoscopy might be needed. And I'll go into that in more detail later. Um, what's happening with reflux disease is you know, this lower esophageal sphincter where the esophagus meets the stomach, sometimes that tone decreases as we age and can add to reflux disease. Now, questions that, you know, GI physicians or you might be asking yourself, um, you know, are what are our red flags? When there's weight loss without trying, um, that's something that we do not like. Um, it sets off some alarm bells. And so if that's been going on, we always try to investigate a little bit more. Dysphagia is a word that's very common to us in the medical world, but what it means is difficulty swallowing. So if there's some sort of difficulty swallowing, we want to investigate further. And of course, if there's any sort of GI bleeding, whether it's vomiting blood or it's black stool, um, we want to investigate that further. Common, you know, kind of side note, black stool can also happen when you're on iron tablets, can turn your stool black. If people are, you know, like black licorice and have a lot of that, that can turn your stool black. And Pepto-Bismol, um, an over-the-counter medication, is known to turn your stool black, too. Um, so it's not always due to bleeding coming from somewhere in the upper GI tract. Um, what are some of the most common GERD-type symptoms that, you know, you might start feeling? Well, there's heartburn, where it's that pain, really, you know, in your chest, in the sternal and the substernal area. Some people, you know, get that reflux where you actually feel like things are coming up into your, you know, esophagus. You get that sour metallic taste in your mouth. Um, things are, you know, just trying to come back up. Some people have chest pain or, you know, problems swallowing. There's nausea. Globus sensation is also another medical term that we use where you just feel like something is stuck. A lot of times when we take a look with an endoscopy, there's nothing there, but there's still that sensation that something might be there. Chronic cough, hoarseness, and wheezing 
all other symptoms that could be related to reflux disease. And so I know this is a little bit of a, a busy chart here, but this is what you know your GI doctor is kind of following when it comes to how to diagnose heartburn. Most people say, I just have it, and I know the symptoms, and that's it. Well, we have you know a little pathway, and everybody's different, so we kind of personalize it to the patient um, and the different kind of risk factors and questions we went over before. But if people are on that medication for about eight weeks, they get relief of their symptoms, they stop the medications and the symptoms come back, well, we need to investigate further with an endoscopy. And I know, you know, the audience here probably knows what an endoscopy is, but I always like to kind of overshare. So endoscopy or EGD is when we take a look through the mouth into the esophagus, the stomach, in the first part of the small intestine. Like I said, the small intestine is very long, and so we're only looking in that first part of the small intestine when we're doing a routine endoscopy. Um, kind of back to this chart then, if you're on the medication, it's really not helping much. You're still getting symptoms. We tend to go to an endoscopy and evaluate to see, is there inflammation? Um, we have grading systems for that. You know. And that can confirm a diagnosis of, you know, reflux that it's creating damage or inflammation in the esophagus. We want to make sure it doesn't lead to precancerous conditions, things called Barrett's esophagus, which I'll touch on again later. Um, but what if people have a normal endoscopy that happens often and they still have symptoms? Well, there are other tests that we can do, um, and they are available at Virginia Hospital Center as well. Um, and it's where you monitor using a probe that goes from the nose into the esophagus. You're monitoring the pH to see if there's refluxing disease because that pH will go down because of the acidity from the stomach coming up into the esophagus. And that's how we can, you know, objectively measure if there's reflux disease going on. There's also, a, you know, a different technology where we put a little capsule and just temporarily attach it to your esophagus during an endoscopy, and we can monitor for reflux that way as well if there's not a clear diagnosis. And so I, I had to put this one in here um, just for my cardiology colleagues um, and the primary cares. My brother, of course, is a, a he's a cardiologist, so we, we fight as to what's more important, and he often wins out um, that... <laughs> We never want to forget about the heart. Um, GERD symptoms or heartburn especially can mimic chest pain or vice versa. And so, you know, part of our workup as a GI doctor, if you say that you're having chest discomfort or heartburn, especially if it doesn't improve with some sort of medication um, or there's certain kind of risk factors there, always make sure that you're telling, you know, your doctor because as you probably heard, Especially as you age, you know, women are not showing signs of heart disease or heart attacks the same way that men get those classic symptoms of chest pain, left arm pain, neck pain, jaw pain. So you just want to, you know, always keep different, you know, keep different options open. And so, what are some of the medications? I feel like that's a very common question. Um, and treatment as far as, you know, GERD that we get in the office. And so we have the anti-reflux measures, which I'm sure, you know, most people here are aware of. When you have that actual reflux that comes up into your esophagus and that sour taste, especially when you're sleeping at night, well, you want to try and put a pillow or two underneath your head to help fight gravity. Um, and so that's what that first line is saying. Also eating kind of small meals, allowing your stomach, um, usually takes about four hours for things, for food to pass through the stomach and somebody with normal motility. Um, so that's why not eating too close to bedtime within two or three hours, that can also help. Now food triggers, um, 
I definitely noticed food triggers as I aged. I used to be able to eat certain, um, you know, salsas or tomato-based sauces um, as much as I wanted, you know, um, 10 years ago, and it just isn't the same. So everybody, you know, there's coffee, caffeine, alcohol, peppermint, um, you know, citrus, uh, tomato-based things. Everything that you like as an adult <laughs> and depend on, especially the coffee and tea and caffeine, they can all be triggers for reflux. So those are some of the things we have to be cognizant about. Um, what is one thing that every doctor of yours is probably harping on and it's very annoying almost? Um, it's weight loss. Um, weight loss, especially if you have a little bit of a belly there, it can help with reflux because there's not as much pressure pushing in, um, trying to force the content back up, if that makes sense, if you lose some of that stomach. And so what are the medications that are available? Most people have probably heard of Pepsid, you know, over the counter. That's an H2 blocker. Um, and famotidine, Pepsid, those types of medications are often used for heartburn. They do not have the you know same side effects as our PPI medications, um, and so they're you know much more safer um, for patients if it controls their disease. However, you know sometimes it's not good at healing inflammation or ulcers if those are already present. So the big topic of discussion, you know, PPI medications, trialing them for eight weeks, you know. The biggest question I get are the side effects. There have been a lot of studies in the past 10 years looking at what are the side effects that we know are true and tried of PPIs. Those can be B12 deficiency, osteoporosis, C. difficile, which is a bacterial infection that can cause diarrhea, microscopic colitis, it's an inflammatory condition where there's no inflammation that you can see with the naked eye, and a uh, diagnosis is only made on biopsy via colonoscopy, but it just makes people have profuse, watery diarrhea. Also, um, low magnesium levels. These are some of the known uh, side effects of PPI medications. Some of the PPI medications, you know, names of them, Protonix, Omeprazole. Prilosec, Nexium, Esomeprazole, Sexalant, Asifex. Um, those are all PPI medications. Now, some people need to be on the PPI medication all their life. Some people, we try to taper it off and use other means if we can. It's really individualized and based on what was found on endoscopy, uh, what was found during the workup. It, I, I can't really make a blanket statement um, for everybody, but at least in my patients who have osteoporosis, who've had fractures, who you know um, have had DEXA scans that are looking at bone density and show decreased bone density, or they're on a medication like Prolia or Denusumab to help with osteoporosis, I really try to stay away from the PPI medications unless we're treating an ulcer for a short period of time or, you know, there's a precancerous condition that we're worried about. Um, there are also over-the-counter medications like Tums, Rolaids. Um, Tums, you can definitely pop them at home, but don't go through a bottle in a day. There can always be side effects from that as well, okay? Um, Gaviscon, you might not have heard of, um, but it works in a different mechanism of action than Pepsid, Protonix, Tums, Rolaids. It um, is alginate based, and what it does is it's a liquid over the counter that you take after meals or at bedtime, and it kind of creates this foamy consistency and coats the esophagus. So, kind of interesting there. Um, of course, always talk to your doctor about these different options and which one's the right one for you if you have these symptoms. And coming on, I'm sorry, this is blurry here, but Barrett's esophagus, what is it and who should be screened? So Barrett's esophagus 
um, is a precancerous condition of the esophagus that can occur when there's been ongoing reflux disease for some period of time. It's found via endoscopy um, and confirmed on biopsies. So, you know, reflux can be silent. It can be giving you symptoms. There are certain groups that have been identified that need to be screened more so. Um, and there are risk factors here that I listed. Some of them you can't really change about yourself, your age, you know, your race. Um, some of them you can work on, such as having a little bit bigger belly, that extra weight there, using tobacco, and controlling reflux disease. But when patients come into the office and they are a male, older than 45, using tobacco and complaining of reflux, that's usually enough for me to say we need to do a one-time endoscopy to take a look and make sure there's no signs of Barrett's esophagus. Now, Barrett's esophagus is down where the esophagus meets the stomach. It's right above that area. That's where we would see it. Um, less than one in 100 people with Barrett's um, develop esophageal adenocarcinoma. Um, these people who have Barrett's esophagus, we work on controlling their reflux disease and we screen them um, depending on different factors of what it looks like on biopsy, how long the segment of Barrett's is, et cetera, every couple of years typically. Um, now dysphagia, that's a big one um, coming into, you know, just aging in general. And so dysphagia, again, what does that mean? I know I said it earlier, it's difficulty swallowing. And so swallowing is happens in different phases. You know, you're it from the mouth all the way down through the esophagus. And so the oropharyngeal, or meaning in the mouth and kind of where the pharynx is back here before you get into the esophagus, that can be a phase where people had difficulty initiating the swallow. And so, you know, we often ask, do you cough a lot when you're trying to swallow? And that would indicate maybe there's aspiration going on because you can't get that first phase of swallowing um, kind of coordinated, those muscles. Um, then, you know, we have others who have esophageal kind of dysphagia, difficulty passing through the esophagus. Sometimes they feel it in the sternum and the substernal areas of the chest. We have to often think, is it a structural issue um, or is it motility, how things move? And so there's different structural issues that we look for on endoscopy and or barium swallow where we make you swallow some barium and take x-rays. Um, there can be benign smooth muscle tissue that's creating a ring at the bottom of the esophagus. There can be inflammatory conditions like esophagitis or eosinophilic esophagitis um, or ulcers going on. Some people who have a very large hiatal hernia, food kind of gets stuck in there a little bit and feels like it's going to come back up. We always worry about cancers as well. Um, and to touch on ulcers, again, you know, sometimes you can get ulcers in the esophagus from different pills that you're taking. Um, if you're on a pill called a bisphosphonate, um, those can create some issues. Sometimes you're on an antibiotic called doxycycline. That can create irritation in the esophagus. So in order to combat this, what we always recommend is sitting upright, you know, while you're taking those medications and about 30 minutes after and taking them with a full glass of water to make sure that they pass into the stomach. Um, now, I also wanna to touch on, you know, there's neuromuscular you know, symptoms or neurological diseases that can cause difficulty swallowing. Um, one is called achalasia. It's fairly rare, but it's when the motility is not intact. And so it, things just stay still and you're trying to swallow, you're trying to move things, and, and it just won't happen. Um, that We diagnose that via esophageal manometry or watching how things move through the esophagus. Um, typically, the tests ahead of it are endoscopy and watching the barium swallow. 
I also bring up the video swallow uh, because that can be very important for helping to diagnose if somebody had a stroke and were worried about their coordinate their muscles of coordination um, initiating a swallow. The video swallow is usually sometimes can be done with a speech therapist as well. And they, you swallow liquids as well as solids, and they take pictures of how it goes down. If you're coughing during, you know, there's a lot of different aspects of this. So just letting you know, there's so many different ways that we can evaluate. There's kind of a streamlined process based on what your symptoms are. Um, but not all, you know, oh, I just choke here and there. Not, it's not always normal. <laughs> um, always, you know, as you get older, dentures are a big thing. My grandma, oh my gosh, the amount of times we went back to that dentist and the, de the dentures didn't quit fit quite right, but, you know, or she wouldn't wear them and having to so think about different things that can affect swallowing um, and your doctors will try to think as well. Um, I always, I just wanted to touch on, you know, things that can promote GI bleeding because as you get older, it seems like that medication list just gets longer and longer. Um, and so there are a couple things that GI doctors are always going to ask you about and don't, don't love, such as NSAID medications, like those are ibuprofen, Advil, Aleve, Naproxen, Celebrex, different, you know, anti-inflammatory drugs um, that are non-steroidal, but they really like to irritate the upper GI tract. So a lot of people, um, I understand you have back aches, the joints aren't working as well, there's arthritis going on, and Tylenol is not cutting it. Well, these medications, NSAIDs, can often lead to ulcers or inflammation. So you just need to be careful um, that you're taking it in moderation. And if you are taking, you know, daily or, you know, heavy doses of it, that you tell one of your doctors, um, even your primary care, just let them know. Now, what are our anticoagulants? Um, Eliquis, Xeralto, Coumadin, Pradaxa. We have all of those medications that people need to be on a lot of times um, because of blood clots or the risk of stroke um, or blood clots for their heart, um, for atrial fibrillation, for different um, valve replacements that they've had. Well, you know, you have to be on this medication, but just know that it it can create, um, you know, it can kind of, if there's a little bit of an ulcer or inflammation somewhere, this is, uh, blood thinner is definitely going to amplify it. And then there's also antiplatelets, especially those who've had um, heart disease in the past or strokes. And you need to be on Plavix, aspirin, Berlinta, you know, clopid clopidogrel um, is a generic name, different medications like that. Well, sometimes I see patients who are on all three of these, and it's just a recipe for a GI bleed at some point. And so sometimes your doctor might um, put you on a PPI medication just to, you know, um, to help prevent the risk of a GI bleed. We don't want to add medications for no reason, um, but it's something that we do think about, especially if you've had a GI bleed or an ulcer or something like that in the past. Now, what else can, you know, lead to GI bleeds? Low platelets. Um, platelets are made by the liver and help you clot. So if you do have liver disease, your, you know, platelets are not able to be made as readily or as well. And so low platelet levels can sometimes promote GI bleeds too. Um, then we have an elevated INR. What's an INR? It tells us how thin your blood is. If people are on Coumadin, they're probably familiar with, you know, the INR needing to be between certain numbers to make their blood thinner. Some people who have liver disease um, tend to have an higher INR as well, meaning they're more likely to bleed. So these are all things that your you know, doctor's also looking at. And one thing I thought was an honorable mention, there are some herbal medications and things like that um, that I know turmeric is used a lot in Indian cooking, especially. Those, that amount of dosage is not going to you know, make you bleed spontaneously or anything. But some people are taking you know, capsules of turmeric, large amounts of it, um, especially for joint diseases and things like that. 
sometimes you might bleed a little bit more easily, especially if you're on one of these other agents like NSAIDs or blood thinners or antiplatelet medications. So just something to keep in mind. To touch on the stomach a little bit, I just wanted to um, say, what is H. pylori? Um, it's a bacteria that can be found in the stomach. I've seen it in a lot of patients um, since I started at VHC, especially because um, our patients have diverse backgrounds, um, different ethnicities, are traveling out of the country a lot. Um, H. pylori, um, what are the symptoms of having this bacteria in your gut? Well, abdominal discomfort, nausea, um, dyspepsia, just feeling bloated, kind of unwell. It actually helps protect against acid reflux, um, interestingly enough. And so how can you get it? It can be fecal oral. It can be in food. You just don't know it. And some people can live their whole life having H. pylori in the gut, and it doesn't affect them. If we do find it, though, treatment is necessary because there's a risk of inflammation, ulcers, and in some cases progressing to a cancer. How do we treat H. pylori? It's with a regimen of antibiotics and um, anti, um, anti-acid medications. Um, I know that the word cancer scares people. Again, there's no recommendation to screen everybody for this. Um, it's just only if people are having symptoms. And this is an interesting topic um, that I think a lot of people um, always want to know more about, um, that what is this gut-brain connection and how does it work? Well, the answer is there's so much research going on right now because we are not 100% sure yet how it works either um, as a you know GI society. But there's a lot of new research coming out because patients, you know, we're having negative tests after negative tests and they say, is my, you know, abdominal pain or, you know, what what is causing it? Is it just in my head? Is, is my reflex, all the tests were negative saying I don't have reflex. I, I'm not making this up. Um, the gut-brain axis is a bi-directional communication system. It's between the enteric or, you know, the GI and central nervous system. The vagus nerve is a large part of the enteric um, nervous system and deals with resting and digesting. Um, the enteric nervous system may be triggered by big emotional shifts. Um, that's experienced by people coping with irritable bowel and functional bowel problems such as constipation, diarrhea, bloating, stomach upset. Um, so per research that's been done at the Cleveland Clinic, key players in this connection include your enteric nervous system or gut nervous system, the vagus nerve, and your gut microbiome. So you know, for example, you know, patients with IBS may become anxious when worrying about finding a bathroom in a strange place or dealing with flare-ups before a big event, um, before a work presentation or a school exam. Um, what are the treatments that are available for these patients um, who have quote-unquote functional GI disorders, that all these tests are negative, but it could be related to the gut-brain axis there? Well, big one that's coming out is cognitive behavioral therapy. And what it is, it's like psychological interventions um, may be able to help improve communication between the brain and the gut. And so patients learn relaxation and stress management techniques they can apply to uh, manage their own everyday stressors. Putting self-management strategies into practice can really create long-term change without the need to remain in um, treatment indefinitely. Multiple studies have found that psychologically based approaches such as cognitive behavioral therapy lead to greater improvement in digestive symptoms compared with only, you know, conventional medical treatment. Something that's been coming out in our guidelines and um, at all our conferences as well in the past, I would say, 10 years is that patients with, you know, abdominal pain related to constipation or diarrhea with other negative testing who are diagnosed with IBS, antidepressants um, such as tricyclic antidepressants are being used to treat these and patients are getting better. Um, so that's just something to kind of keep in mind um, as, as you go through your physicians. 
needed to bring up the pancreas because, you know, I have a lot of patients as well who come in saying, do I need to be screened for pancreatic cancer? You know, um, because pancreatic cancer is difficult. It's something that's usually found in, you know, advanced stages. Um, and people, you know, symptoms, you see jaundice, which is, you know, eyes turning yellow, skin turning yellow, weight loss without trying, sometimes abdominal pain. Um, another thing is new onset diabetes. If it's, you know, somebody's not overweight um, and, you know, doesn't have the classic kind of symptoms of diabetes and it's quite sudden, something could be going on with the pancreas. And so yesterday was World Pancreatic Cancer Awareness Day. Just wanted to let everyone know that, but who needs to be screened? If you have a first degree relative with pancreatic cancer, we typically start screening at age 50 or 10 years younger than when they were diagnosed. Um, and how do we screen? With an MRI or an endoscopic ultrasound. Um, an endoscopic ultrasound is uh, an endoscopy. We take a look into the, we go into the stomach, and then there's a special ultrasound on the end of it, and we're able to look through the stomach to the pancreas. It's done by an advanced GI doctor, so your general GI doctors typically don't do this, but um, in our group, Dr. Saad Haq, does do these procedures. So it's very nice to have them on our team. Um, there are some known gene mutations that can be associated with pancreatic cancer. So if anyone has these in their you know, um, family history, typically we'll start screening again at age 50. If you, know, you want to know inf more information or there's a large stream of you know, cancers in the family and no, nothing that's really known, there are genetic counselors available. When I see a young patient who has even, you know, colon cancer and they're sub 40 years old, I wonder, is there a genetic, you know, uh, mutation and often, you know, advise them to see a genetic counselor at some point. All right, the liver. So we're getting to the liver and the biggest thing I wanted to touch on was just fatty liver, um, it's metabolic fatty liver disease. And what kind of causes this? It's obesity, okay, patients with diabetes often, high cholesterol and high blood pressure. Um, some, you know, you don't even notice fatty liver, your labs might be normal, the liver function test might be normal, maybe an ultrasound or a CT you had for a different reason kind of picks it up. Well, fatty liver is really becoming one of the most common causes of cirrhosis. People don't have to be, you know, an alcoholic. Um, there are other causes of cirrhosis as well, like autoimmune type diseases or hepatitis, like hepatitis B or C. So what's the, you know, treatment for fatty liver? It's really difficult, but choosing healthy foods, avoiding foods that are high in fat and sugar, trying to stay active. And so by losing weight, we want it to be done slowly, just a half a pound to a pound a week, not faster than that, because sometimes that can even injure the liver. Um, lipid control, so cholesterol control, if you have to be on a statin medication um, to help with that. Blood sugar control, especially if you're a diabetic. Avoiding alcohol and avoiding medications that can damage the liver. You can safely take up to four grams of Tylenol a day, just by the way. And studies have shown that if you lose 10% of your total body weight, if you are obese, it can actually reverse fibrosis. Um, in patients who have fatty liver, not due to alcohol. And so just wanted to show a picture, you know, normal, healthy liver kind of hanging out. If you have a fatty liver, there's some deposits in there. And when you have a fatty liver, it can lead to inflammation. What happens to that inflammation? It either heals normally or it scars down and creates fibrosis and scarring. So that's where we get cirrhosis of the liver you know, eventually. And if you have cirrhosis of the liver, then you have um, a greater chance of getting liver cancer. The gallbladder, wanted to touch on that as well. Um, sometimes it's a surgeon's domain, but gallstones are very, very, very common. If everybody who had gallstones um, had their gallbladder removed, the surgeons would be so busy. Um, it's very, gallstones are common, um, affecting 10% of adults and 20% of those over the age of 65. 
only 20% of people diagnosed with gallstones will actually need treatment. Those are the statistics out there. And so what are the risk factors? It's going to be, we say, females over the age of 40. Um, if you are obese, because that's the extra cholesterol kind of getting in there. Um, and interestingly enough, rapid weight loss after surgery, if you get a gastric bypass or something like that, you're more likely to develop cholesterol stones. If, you know, we also see gallbladder polyps, if they're over a centimeter, um, they can have a malignant potential. So that can be another reason why gallbladder needs to come out. Just wanted to touch on that. And so here's one of our big, you know, topics. As we age, we know that contraction and movement of the colon decreases with age. And you have an increased sensitivity to pain medications, which can also, you know, cause drug-induced constipation. Diverticulosis um, is just benign outpouching of the colon. Um, it happens very often in Western populations over the age of 50. And why does that happen? It's because of the decrease in the strength of the muscle wall, um, in the compliance of the bowel wall, and increased intra-abdominal pressure sometimes for defecation. And so the main thing that I always tell patients with diverticulosis is to avoid constipation. You want soft, bulky, easy to pass stools. What are some of the medications that can cause it? Anticholinergic medications. Um, sometimes for urinary incontinence, you're on those types of medications. So there's you know, also narcotics are notorious for slowing down the bowel as well. Um, so there's there's anal rectal issues. Females have been through a lot down there in the pelvis. Um, some, you know, have had hysterectomies. Some have, um, you know, bared multiple children. Um, men, I'm not discrediting you. There's also been surgeries and hernias and everything for everybody. Um, so pelvic floor is something where you can have issues just passing stool through that area. Um, it's more so of the colorectal doctor's domain. They have a lot of different testing that they can do to make sure that the sphincters are working well, um, that you're sensing things well. But just want to let you know about that. Adhesions from multiple surgeries um, kind of get the bowel frozen in place, and that can add to constipation. We always worry about cancers, and I'll touch on that later. But the thyroid, people who have um, an abnormal thyroid, hypothyroidism, it, it can lead to constipation as well. Um, neurologic issues like Parkinson's disease, um, people with strokes, people who don't move around a lot are more bed bound. Um, so that can lead to constipation as well. And you, <laughs> you would think that, you know, we do have a chart for everything. I mean, we often have these in the office, too, that there are different ways to classify stools. One through three are more of the constipation side. Four is kind of what people are aiming for, and five through seven are more on the diarrheal end. And so what is the main stay? What can you do yourself at home, especially if you're experiencing just kind of minor straining or constipation? Well, I kind of call it a recipe. Water is the main driver of the colon, so just try to stay hydrated if you can. Um, high fiber diet with a goal of 20 to, uh, 25 to 30 grams of fiber per day. 25 for women, 30 is recommended for men. Um, there are fiber supplements that you can get over the counter, like psyllium or metamucil, benefiber, or citrusel, even tablets if you feel like the metamucil or citrusel is kind of just sitting in your stomach. There are pills that are available. Um, and then stool softeners. I know there's, you know, Docalax and Senna S and Senna Cot. I tend to like docusate and Colace because they're not going to have that proponent laxative effect. These are just going to soften your stool. And so it's not going to, you know, create pain. The only side effect is it can make things too soft. Um, and it's, you're not going to kind of build tolerance to these stool softeners either. There are laxatives over the counter, like Miralax, taking 17 grams. People ask me all the time, is it okay to take it every day? I have some patients that that's, that's what they need to do, and that's, you know, they're normal. It's not everybody. Um, you know, we need a proper evaluation and have gone through the steps and examination, but some people, yeah, that's, that's what they need. 
And just to touch on diarrhea, I feel like um, just a very, very broadly, diarrhea can be induced by colitis and ischemic colitis is something as people age um, that we see more often. Ischemic means you're not getting good blood flow to some area of the bowel. That can be caused by, you know, a clot breaking off somewhere um, or um, you're not, you know, your blood pressure is too low one day for some reason. Maybe there's an, another infection going on um, affecting your body. Um, and what's going to happen is the gut, you know, the heart's going to want blood pumped to it. The brain's going to want blood pumped to it. And your gut might take the, um, take the brunt. And so sometimes we see ischemic disease in that um, setting. Now, people get infections all the time. Our, our stool studies, especially norovirus, it's a virus and can create diarrhea, vomiting. And the hardest part is it's passed um, by, you know, fecal oral or touching. And in, you know, nursing homes, it's very popular. Um, and so cruise ships as well, it's, it's difficult. Just practice good hand washing if you can. There's also inflammatory colitis, which is ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, diverticulitis. Um, that's when I hear a lot. Um, diverticulitis is inflammation of those pockets in the colon um, or infection of those pockets. But if you just have the pockets and they're not bothering you and there's no inflammation, no infection, that's just called diverticulosis. And one thing, sorry, people ask me a lot is, can I eat seeds, nuts, things like that if I have diverticulosis? Well, the new data says, yes, that's fine. But if it bothers you and creates pain, then you stay away from it. So if eating sunflower seeds or popcorn, you know, bothers you, then stay away from it. If not, you can eat, you know, nuts, seeds, etc. cetera. Colitis, um, inflammation of the colon, we always have to rule out that there's not a cancer in there too causing the inflammation sometimes. Another thing that um, colorectal kind of handles um, a bit more is fecal incontinence, meaning either you can't get to the bathroom in time or you don't even have the sensation um, that you need to go. So there's different ways to kind of uh, look at this more and classify it and treat based on what they find. Now, we all knew that this was going to come up, <laughs> um, colon cancer screening. Um, who needs to be screened? Um, within the past 10 years, the age has gone to 45 years for the average person. Um, if you have a family history in a first degree relative, meaning mom, dad, sister, brother, child, which I hope not, um, you screen 10 years younger than when they were diagnosed. So, you know, I get a patient in the office, uh, my mom was diagnosed with colon cancer when she was 60 years old. Well, 10 years younger than that would be 50, but 40 years old comes first. So we would start screening at 40. Um, if that makes sense. There's certain genetic syndromes, again, that, you know, we screen at different times. And a question I ask, I get asked a lot, who, when do we stop? Well, each person is different. Um, I had a lady in the office who came with a positive cola guard the other day. She was 85. Um, not sure why we were doing a cola guard on a lady who was 85 who could not tell me the year. Um, but we look at the overall health because if this person is able to undergo anesthesia, that's one thing I think about. Are they willing to undertake the risk? There could be a risk of perforation with colonoscopy. Um, or if I did find a cancer, could they, would they want surgery? Could they actually undergo surgery and come out of it? These are all questions that I ask myself and ask the patient too, um, instead of just saying, yeah, 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 just, just, just sign up for a colonoscopy, it'll be fine. And I think every patient is different and we always have to consider the risks and the benefits. Um, also, one thing that I always like to, uh, you know, tell patients is call your insurance to see what, you know, they should cover screening colonoscopies, but sometimes you do have to pay a portion. Um, I really, I know this is on the record, I really don't like insurances. Um, <laughs> I wish they would just understand why we do tests and cover things. Um, but colonoscopy should be covered, but always, you know, call just so there's no surprises. I don't want to do a test, um, you know, and somebody end up with a huge bill and 
there be an issue later on. We can always try to provide more information or figure out if the different test is needed first, um, things to kind of think about. And so what are the different ways to get screened? Um, there is colonoscopy that if you're young, healthy, can undergo anesthesia. If you have a history of polyps or a history um, of somebody in the family with colon cancer, colonoscopy is the right test for you if you're able to do the bowel prep and undergo anesthesia. Now there are stool tests and stool DNA tests that are available. The stool tests, they're very non-specific, meaning um, if the FIT or FOBT, so fecal occult blood test, if they're positive, it can be due to microscopic blood anywhere in the GI tract. It's not specific to the colon. Um, the stool DNA test, that's the Cologuard test. Um, I've also had patients uh, tell me that, you know, somebody else has ordered the Cologuard test and they did get a $300 bill. So I always, you know, if you're going to be going to the colonoscopy anyway, just Again, ask your insurance, and I try to save costs <laughs> if we can, um, if we're going to be doing certain tests anyway. But the stool DNA, the Cologuard, it is positive 10% of the time, but a false positive. So if you were to do a colonoscopy, things look normal then. It can also have a false negative of 6 to 8% of the time. The test is negative. You do a colonoscopy, you'd find a polyp or growth 6 to 8% of the time. So again, we're really kind of seeing who that test is correct for. If you're somebody who's on the fence about colonoscopy or um, maybe can't undergo anesthesia, but you know, we, we have to kind of think of different ways. There's a CT colonography um, mostly used if you have very a very difficult colon. Colonoscopy is, you know, it, it, they can't get all the way around the colon for some reason. Um, then a CT colonography can tell us if there are polyps or growths, usually greater than five millimeters in size. Um, but again, no test is perfect, even colonoscopy, okay? Um, that's why we always urge you to clean out well <laughs> so we can get a very good look. Um, one thing people always ask is the bowel prep. What's, what's new and what? how can I get a better one than I had last time when I had the four liters of fluid I had to drink. Well, the go lightly is still there in the hospital, so I'm sorry. And some insurances, you know, will only cover that four liters of go lightly. Well, there's SUTAB, which are the tablets. You take 12 the night before and 12 the morning of. There's a little bit larger pills. Um, so if you have any difficulty swallowing, that's not for you. Insurances won't cover SUTAB but we do have coupons. Um, and then being taste conscious, stew prep can be very sweet um, and salty, but some insurance companies really like that one for their patients. Movie prep is not too bad. And Clenpick tastes a little bit more like fruit juice. Um, but again, we try and give you guys coupons because I want to be kind of cost conscious if I can, um, and then taste conscious as well. So I've tried a couple of these, not the full bowel prep, but just to see what my patients go through. Um, and it still kind of tastes like medicine. It's not fun, but I promise we're doing it for a good cause. Um, and this is the reason again. So this is a colon, um, a colonoscopy, and you can see wow, this looks healthy, normal, I can see all of the tissue. Here's a, that's an excellent prep. A good prep is, you know, there's a little bit of that yellow kind of left over. That's um, something that our body and a film, our body naturally produces. And that's why that second dose of prep is actually important because it helps get that, even though you're like, I'm clean, there's nothing left inside of me, no more stool that second dose of prep is still important because it's helping get that film off. Um, I see some fair and poor preps and, you know, um, inadequate sometimes. And our guidelines, you know, require you to come back sooner because we're not able to get a good look or suction up all of that with our scope. Um, it clogs the scope. Yeah, you can't get, you know, firm pieces of stool up. You know, you could miss polyps underneath there. I had this a gentleman who was 45 years old and he was so upset. He goes, no, I thought I got 10 years, no polyps. And I said, I'm so sorry, sir. I couldn't, you know, I couldn't see everything very well and a polyp could have been missed. Um, and so sometimes 
you know, it's just the prep was tasted really bad. Sometimes, um, you know, instructions are difficult to kind of follow. But sometimes you have really bad constipation um, at baseline. And we try to, you know, sometimes we do a two-day bowel prep of clear liquids for two days if possible to help clean out the bowel and get the best picture we can. Um, and so some people are interested in how we actually do it. I almost call it a lasso. Um, so here's your scope. The colon is about four to five feet in length, um, and then it attaches to the small bowel. If we can, we try and peek in there to uh, make sure it looks normal and healthy. But on our, our exam, we do a good exam on the way out looking for any polyps or growth. And say you see a little polyp there, we actually have a snare. It looks kind of like a lasso, and we cut polyps out. So those polyps don't regrow. It just tells us about your colon that, you know, you like to grow polyps. And my last um, slide, uh, almost my last slide, I just wanted to touch on weight loss agents. Um, it's something, um, even within my family, so many people are like, is there a pill that you can just give me to lose weight? Um, seems like all my problems would be solved and it would help. Well, there's a lot of different medications out there especially called GLP-1 agonists that people are taking for weight loss, but also for diabetes. Um, and there are certain GI side effects that are associated with them. I actually saw a patient um, two days ago in the office, um, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain. Um, he had already gotten better after his dose of Wigovi was decreased. So, you know, sometimes we, you know, we do see these um, GI side effects. It causes these medications cause the GI tract to move more slowly. Um, and so that's where you get that feeling of getting full more easily. Um, I know that the, in uh, September, the FDA made an update to the um, Ozempic and the drug labeling that gastrointestinal disorders known as ileus. What is an ileus? It means that there is flowing of motility through the small bowel to the point where you feel like you have a bowel obstruction. Um, although there's no, um, there's nothing there blocking, um, but it's just that it's almost frozen, things aren't moving. This, an ileus is reported as an adverse effect of the medication. Um, and so, yeah, the intestines temporarily lose their ability to contract. People also experience constipation or diarrhea, abdominal pain, and definitely bloating, because if things aren't moving through the system, you're definitely going to get more bloated. And I try to ask my patients in the office when we're doing procedures um, if they're on any of these medications, because anesthesia has, um, you know, guidelines and rules that they want to hold these medications for one week prior to the procedure, or they will cancel it because there is an aspiration risk um, that's been reported. So, you know, if you have any of these symptoms, talk to your doctor, the one who prescribes it, or, you know, your primary care about the dosage, um, stepping up slowly if you need to, and, you know, how, what kind of side effects to expect. Um, and here, my last slide, I just wanted to um, let you all know that if you haven't made it to the outpatient pavilion in the past, um, since it opened, um, it is a beautiful building. It's very nice to work here. Um, and there are so many subspecialties within this building. So it's really nice because we're able to work closely with our colleagues, whether it be in colorectal or urology or cardiology or primary care. Um, all of us are in this building and have offices here. Um, our BHC, gastroenterology department, has grown significantly. We now have um, a group that's employed by the hospital. And so we see patients inpatient, we see patients outpatient, and we are expanding to, we have an office in Tyson's in McLean. Um, I am in Kingstown at least one day a week for office. And then we're here in Arlington as well. Um, we're going to get scoping, um, you know, endoscopy, colonoscopies at Tyson's sometimes in, sometime in 2024 as well. So that'll be very exciting um, for patients who live closer to that area. Um, but there's also labs and imaging available on the first floor of the outpatient pavilion, which has made it really convenient when we see patients um, in the office and they have their labs done before they leave. 
Um, that way they're only making one trip here um, if they can, and they don't have to go over to the main hospital um, as the weather gets cooler. <laughs> so it's um, a convenience and a beautiful building, um, and the parking garage is located right next to it as well. So thank you all so much um, for allowing me to come on and you know, give this uh, talk with you. I wish I could see you and we could be in person, um, but thanks again. Thank you so much, Dr. Patel. That was incredibly informative and um, I appreciate how clearly you walked through the, the various issues. I'm sure everybody on this webinar could relate to at least one or more of those issues that you touched <laughs> on. So thank you so much. I do have a few questions. Do you have a time, a couple minutes for uh, take a question, a few questions or? I, I want to respect your time. Okay. Of course. Great. So let me just jump in here. Um, can you, is there any, is there a Tums product that can be used by people who shouldn't take calcium supplements because of potential stones? That's a good question. Um, I Not specifically that I know of, but in, instead of Tums, that's where I would talk to your primary care or your um, GI provider to see if one of the other medications might be a better rescue than Tums for you, um, such as taking that Gaviscon after meals um, or you know, adding Pepsid in morning and evening. Um, because yeah, if you're, you know, the calcium levels, we have to worry about that um, with too many Tums. Okay, great. Um, are you able to comment on biologic and biosimilar medicines for patients living with inflammatory conditions? Yeah, so that's a very broad topic. And, you know, one thing um, that, you know, we use those a lot for our patients with inflammatory bowel disease, biologics and biosimilars. Yes, they, you can go between the two. Patients with biologics definitely want to be followed, you know, at least every six months or so um, with labs because your immune system um, might be lower. And so, you know, whether you're seeing your gastroenterologist every six months, um, you know, overlapping with primary care, um, there's different, you know, you wanna make sure that you are getting your vaccinations, like the flu vaccine and COVID vaccine um, and pneumonia vaccines, but you want to be careful taking shingles vaccines um, or certain live vaccines while you're on biologics. So it's important to talk to you, whoever is prescribing that medication, um, the biologic, and uh, make sure to see what you're eligible for and what you should based on your age have um, and kind of go from there. As far as um, biologics, I use them a lot. I think they're great. Um, I you always have to look at the side of potential side effects um, of these types of medications and which one is right for which patient. Um, a lot of them are coming out in injectable forms now. Um, so people who are more independent or traveling, I have a lot of you know state department workers who are you know out, need to be more mobile. And then I have you know different patients that nope, I want to come in for an infusion every eight weeks and get my labs at that time, and it's just easier for them to do it that way. Um, so, yeah, sorry, I, I know that I kind of answered a little bit of it, but. That's great, that's great. So this question came up, this next one, when you were talking about colonoscopies, can you speak a little bit about mm -hmm. scar tissue in the colon? And I guess the implication is how that impacts. Um, yeah, so good question. Yep. Um, I, being a female GI provider, I definitely see a lot of female patients for their colonoscopies and um, patients who have had multiple surgeries um, can have scar tissue, whether they feel it or not. Um, and so, you know, sometimes it makes it, the colonoscopy a little bit tricky, but I, you know, I was told once by my, um, somebody who, my, one of my mentors, that if stool can get through, so can you. So, you know, you just have to, your provider chooses the correct scope. Um, there's, you know, a smaller diameter scope. Sometimes if you need to get around tighter turns. Um, um, so I, a lot of times on women um, who are, you know, have it more petite or have had multiple surgeries, I'll use a pediatric um, scope, which is the same length, but a smaller diameter. Um, you know, so just to make sure that I'm able to kind of get around easily if there is scar tissue. Now, how do you know if you have scar tissue? 
that can only be known if you are opened up by a surgeon and they see it. So um, it's something that we kind of have to infer or assume. But sometimes when I'm doing a colonoscopy, I can tell, oh, that was a tight turn or that was, you know, that's probably from, you know, a prior hysterectomy or um, some sort of, you know, surgery like that. Okay. Okay. Um, one individual mentioned that um, um, she burps frequently, burps a lot. And I'm wondering if there's anything that can be done about that or any suggestions at your end of things to maybe what they're eating or how other things that they could do. I know that's, that's again, something that we see, I feel like a lot. Um, it can, it's a very broad, broad differential as far as, you know, it could be something as simple as you, if you're, you know, sucking on candies, chewing gum, drinking through straws, that can create more what's called aerophasia, that you're bringing in more air into the stomach, carbonated beverages. It could be something such as, you know, maybe a bacteria like H. pylori, um, you know, living in the stomach, causing you to have more burping. Um, could it be, you know, there, there's so many Sure. Could it be related to reflux or, um, you know, slow emptying of the stomach, um, kind of coming back? It, you know, bloating is another symptom that kind of goes along with that, that has so many different possible etiologies. And medicine is very, um, it's frustrating sometimes where we don't know the exact cause, but we have to rule out different things that it's not. And that's definitely frustrating for the provider and the patient as we kind of go through um you know, trial and error and different testing, you know, scans based on the history and what other symptoms they might have or, you know, prior antibiotic use or different medications that they might be on or structural anatomy that we can see. Um, so, yeah, you got me there. That That's a very tough one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but sorry, you were mentioning different foods. So like cruciferous vegetables, um, broccoli, cabbage, um, different things, legumes, beans, different things like that let off more um, gas too. Mm -hmm. So that can even, you know, relate to more burping. Tr trigger more of that. Okay, great. So let's just take one more here. Again, this might, you know, some of these obviously you have to answer on a case by case basis, but just in general, this individual is asking if it's okay to take one um, naproxen daily without causing a problem. Is that anything that you so good, comment. good question. Um, you know, I, I ask people if they're taking one naproxen a day, um, you know, if it, you always have risk benefit. If you have horrible arthritis, even when I have joint pains or cramps, Tylenol doesn't work for me. So I definitely understand and commiserate. Um, and I will use an Advil. Um, you know, so it, it's that naproxen is a little bit harsher on the upper GI tract than Celebrex. Um, Celebrex has a little bit of a protective property. So if, you know, we talk with your primary care and that's an option for you, something you have to be on daily, um, maybe that might be better. If you don't have any history of GI bleeding, you're not anemic, you know, you're not seeing black stool, um, you're not on any other blood thinners or antiplatelet agents, you're not getting bad heartburn, acid reflux, you know, signs like that, then, you know, it, it sounds like you need it. And that's what, you you know, we're, we're all human before, you know, I'm a doctor, but I also understand that, you know, uh, you have to have it for your quality of life. So that would be um, kind of my answer. See if, you know, if you have to be on it long term, if there's an alternative that might be less harsh on the stomach. Um, but if not, just watch for those signs and symptoms as well. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Patel. Really great stuff. And um, just want to remind the audience that I will be sending out a recording of this um, next week, certainly before the Thanksgiving holiday. So you can look for that um, and go back and review any information that um, you'd like to see again or hear again. So I want to wish everyone a wonderful weekend and also a, a very good Thanksgiving next week. Thank you so much, Dr. Patel. Really appreciate your time and expertise this morning. Of course, everyone have a good Thanksgiving. Bye. All right, take care. Bye-bye, everyone.